Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the South Africa Podcast. You're listening to myself, Ivik Wolf here, and we have a special guest in uh, at Wolf. Hello. Uh, and our co-host in Scratch, as always. Yo. Yo. Um, and we're going to be talking about... Sure. We're going to be talking about Advolf's um, new up-and-coming book. We're going to be talking about the writing process a little bit. We're going to be talking about a whole bunch of whatever whatever sort of comes to mind. Uh, for those of you who've been here often, you have an idea as to what we tend to do uh, with guests. But so what I first want to do and uh, what I actually want to ask Advolf firstly is um, you, while we were sort of gearing up towards the interview, mentioned that you're not necessarily at Wolf anymore. Yes, not necessarily. Um, the thing is, yeah, and I'll, I'll get into this a bit later as well, but I had to jump through a lot of hoops to actually get into the mind of the main character. And one of the things that I did was to change my persona from a art wolf to a kudu. And I haven't looked back since, actually. The uh, problem is, if your handle online is art wolf, but you're a kudu, then people are going to get confused because a lot of people don't even know what a kudu is. So I kind of flip between art wolf and art book. And then, of course, on the book itself, I've got my real name because that's probably not going to change anytime soon. I mean, we can dream. <laughs> we we could, but yeah, I I I it took thirty years to get my signature right, so I'm gonna have to get a new signature if I change my name. So maybe not. Yeah, my stick, right. my signature still looks like garbage anyway. Same. Mm. It doesn't. It's never been. I've never actually written my signature the same way. Mm. Twice. Yeah. Ever. Try getting an affidavit. The, the, <laughs> the police are like, like, yeah. It's actually such an archaic uh, way to do things. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, digital signatures, yes. Uh, handwritten signatures, I don't know. Yeah, anyway, but... sig Sorry, Sorry. Signal, moving, yeah. moving along swiftly. Moving along yeah. swiftly. <laughs> signatures aside, um, let's talk about your signature book. In um, Now, obviously, the second one in the series, Rekindled. Yes. Yeah, no, the, the book used to be... In, uh, in the writing phase, it was called Green Fields, mm -hmm. but I had a bit of a, uh, a light bulb moment, and I thought maybe since the first book is called Rewritten, I should call the second book Rekindled, just to keep the branding going. But at, in the same breath, I've got a problem with sequels, if they are not planned as part of the original series. And I didn't actually plan to write a sequel to Rewritten. So I kind of had to go through a process where I wrote a follow-up, but I really don't like calling it a sequel. Um, I've got a completely different uh, plot. I've got a new main character. And I think the character of the book and the, the story itself is very different from Rewritten. Uh, with Rewritten, I was going for a sort of a existential horror feel. Um, with Rekindled, it's more of a sci-fi adventure with some romantic elements in as well. So, with that being said, like, how do you make that kind of jump between sci-fi and then horror? Like, what exactly, uh, what's, firstly, how do you even begin to sort of calculate that kind of change? And then secondly, like, what does it do to your, your entire world? Well, it's the same world. The rules of the world haven't changed. Um, but the big thing is with the new main character and also the first book was um, the plot played off in the sort of the wastelands, the outside of civilization, middle of nowhere, um, where everything is basically in ruin. Now, the new book takes place in the city of Bridgend, which is like the capital city of their world. That's where everything happens. That's where you want to go if you want to get anywhere in life. So it, it came naturally once I actually got into the character's head. And I had an awful lot of fun actually fleshing out the city. I kind of touched on it in the first book, or first, second chapter a little bit. But I actually got to explore the city in quite a bit of detail in this new retelling, or this new telling. All right. So, I mean, with that being said, obviously different characters, same world... 
Um, but what exactly makes your world unique? Um, in, in respect, actually, what 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 makes it? Hmm, I'm trying to figure out how to say this correctly. From book one to book two, you've sort of explained that that's kind of how you're going to change them. But what exactly? can people expect from the characters from book one to book two? So and what makes them, yeah, what makes them unique book wise? Okay. So, uh, rewritten was a very inward journey for the main character. It's, it's a big process of discovering himself and discovering the origins of their world. Um, the new book, the main character, his name is Oakmore uh, slash Isando and I'll, Tell you why it's got two names as well uh, going a bit forward. The city is what it is. You don't go into the city and change the city to work for you. You go into the city and you find your place and you find how you can fit in. Um, that's kind of the approach that I took here. So I kind of had to start with an idea in my head of how this whole place fits together. And... I always like to think of Bridge End. It's a bit like Zootopia, but with smoke, slums, um, whorehouses, and factories. So it's 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 got a very gritty uh, industrial feel to it. That's kind of the aesthetic I was going for as well. Uh, diesel punk without the wingless flight. Hmm. Okay. Um, sure, that's a lot to take in. Um, when it... As as you're changing your or not your characters, but like when you were writing these particular sort of changes uh, in this world that you'd already created, like was it difficult to make that kind of like switch, or was it sort of just a general like okay, this is what I want to do now kind of thing? I'm pretty much just sort of asking uh, whether it was whether it was a learning curve. Um. In terms of the city itself, I actually had a whole lot of ideas left from the first book. Things that I wanted to show the uh, the reader, but I didn't have the opportunity to. So when the second book came along, I just kind of smiled very broadly and I said, okay, let's get down to showing all these little nooks and crannies. Um, like one of the things that I really wanted to explore was the train culture in Bridgend. Um, the metro is their main form of transportation there um i really i like trains and if you know me you probably know that so i tried to create a whole culture around that too and then you would travel to the different parts of the city each part of the city has its own little quirks and things the kind of uh, mammals you'd find there and it, it it was a that part of the writing process was a lot of fun for me All right because that reminds me of like weirdly enough that that kind of reminds me of gaming culture and oddly enough a game that came out what it was it in the 2000s mm -hmm. um scratch you're gonna have to help me out here uh it involved oh goodness now this has to hit me <laughs> um Nope, it's completely and absolutely okay. destroyed. I can't no, help you with gone. no leads. Yeah, there's absolutely none. You're a single hero. Um, you started off as a kid. Uh, uh, you were called hero very often. Uh, you were part of a guild of heroes. What kind of game is it? Uh, like third person, top down, shooter, third, brawler? Third person. Mm -hmm. uh, from behind, over the shoulder. It's a um, Mm-mm. Um, sort of medieval. Um, you fable. could either be good fable, fable, fable specifically. Okay. I'm not sure if you're familiar with fable at all. Oh, I've, I'm so out of touch with games. I think the last game I played seriously was Doom, um, Doom Three. To give you any kind of idea, fables in the same range year wise. Mm. Is it? Mm. Mm, maybe. maybe. Any, sure, but, yeah. but any case, it's um, but so when it comes to the reason why I'm mentioning Fable is because every single uh, area that you went into 
like you're mentioning, had a different group of people. So what I'm sort of asking here is, is that you've got these districts, you've got, um, what's the word? Re uh, what would you call like classified rich districts versus medium, uh, medium class, middle class, <laughs> lower class, you know, slums and things like that. Is that what you're kind of, is, is that how you see city building kind of works? Yes. Yeah. Kind of like uh, Cape Town in essence, Cape Town or uh, Johannesburg, those any, kinds of places. Any major city, really. Yeah, any major yeah. city. Yeah. A lot of inspiration came from uh, my time that I was in London. Um, London has also got these grand old uh, places, and then you go around the corner, you get to Candom Town where you've got all these punks, and then you go to another place where there's all of these river boats on the locks. And then you go to another place. He has a Brazilian neighborhood and there's a Pakistani neighborhood. You know, that, that kind of feel. And then obviously some areas are more wealthy than others. Some are better if you want to involve criminal elements. It's easier to hide. Some, I mean, for example, there's a place called Poison Town. Um, where they've put all their dirty industry and the groundwater is poisonous there. You can't grow anything. Uh, you know, if you want to pollute, you go there. If you want to hang with the big guns and the bankers and stuff, you go to the canal. And then there's also a district called Watertown, which is right at the north of the city island. That's where you find all the water-based uh, animals like otters and seals um, our hero does a few trips there as well. And there's, it's a big culture difference. For example, in Watertown, if you walk into a pub there, they won't sell you beer because nobody drinks it. They just drink uh, uh, stuff like rum and whiskey there. Hmm. Okay, that's that's an interesting um, mechanic. Uh, is, is there obviously... So... In essence, what exactly are you representing when you're looking at these kinds of differences between mammalia? It's it's like Zootopia. I mean, in Zootopia, you've got your desert district, you've got your um, uh, polar district. I forget, Tundra or something. Mm -hmm. You know, these these animals have a certain affinity. District. Yeah, rainforest district. I mean, certain mammals have a certain affinity for a certain kind of surrounding. Um, so, kind of hinting at that as well. Okay, Scratch, do you want to field a question? Um, hmm. Sorry. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm just wondering <laughs> now. Um, actually, uh, if we sort of... Uh, hmm, if we, can, we can sort of jump topic from, um, from the book to uh, what we mentioned uh, earlier before. Uh, like earlier before we went online, um, you mentioned something about the Hoover community. I'm quite interested to hear what you have to say about that. Yes. So, um, yeah, the joy of becoming a Kudu, you implicitly become part of the Hoover community. And, you know, I actually joined two or three Hoover groups on, um, on Telegram. And I've actually found myself randomly following deer and other antelope on Twitter. And I must say, they are a very agreeable bunch, and I enjoy their company. Um, if you go in terms of furry stereotypes, I would say they're very nature-orientated, cons conservation-orientated. Um, very pleasant people, actually. And I also find that they like to stick together and involve other hoofers in the things that they do. So heard... I was meant yeah. to say that. <laughs> sort, of a, okay. sort of a herd mentality, yes. And for, for me, hoofers would include things like sheep and goats and cows as well. Um, one of the groups that I've joined is specific for deer. The other group is an antelope group, which is a bit wider. Obviously, anyone is welcome to join. It's just interesting. There are other people who are looking at alternative species rather than wolves and foxes and dogs. Understandable. Hmm. Yes, and you know, I I like the kudu persona that I've got, so I'll hang on to it. It's cute, actually. <laughs> I, I I know that's not the word that I should be using. It's majestic, <laughs> they're majestic animals. 
Yeah. No, I remember back when when we still had, well, we didn't, but my uncle had the family farm. Uh, we used to see a lot of kudus in the felt and mm-hmm. we'd go hunting. Sorry. And I would say to myself, you know what? Shit, do I really have to shoot this animal to get close to it? Because they're so beautiful. They're so muscular. They're so majestic, you know. But at the same time, they're so scared and they just run away when they see you. Um, that's a thought. The other thought that I had was, you know, these buck, they they move around. They don't have a, um, what do you call it? They don't have a territory like a predator would where you kind of stay in your, in your territory. So that's one of the ideas that I played with in this book as well, is that there's this culture among the hoofed, um, mammals in this book that they always want to move along they uh, there's the one thing that's called the season it's kind of the mating season as we would know in our world but what happens is in springtime all these hoofers flood into bridge end from the countryside and you know there's a certain connotation attached to you if you are a hoofer in the city at that time people assume you're a seasonal so they assume you're just looking for a good time if you work you're just working to make money to go get drunk somewhere um our our main character has been in the city for 20 seasons so he's definitely not a a seasonal but he does get classified as that and then yeah one of the themes of the book is always moving on that's one of the things that the main character has to find within himself whether he actually uh, buys into this idea that his kind are seasonal breeders. They take a mate for a season and then they move on to another one the next season. And also, you know, settling down versus doing something and moving on. So, and obviously you sort of hinted at it in respect to your own personality. and So, one of the questions here in respect to the book and how close it might be to what you, um, I'm sorry for the background uh, noise if there is any, uh, but yeah, I, hold on. No worries. Hmm. Um, okay. Right. Uh, <laughs> sorry. No worries. So what I was trying to get at is is that like when it comes to seasonals, gods, I've lost my way here. Go scratch, go. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Uh, what did uh, sort of you mentioned earlier about the the name Greenfield? Uh, yes. What's the sort of connotation between uh, the books and uh, Project Greenfields? Is that sort of the overarching like? series title is that something you're working on in the background is it something else okay so the the world i like to call the artisans and opportunists world Mm -hmm. um greenfields was kind of a code name which means i'm going to try something different this time around and this some the something different this time around was i actually wanted to do a visual novel oh okay so i ended up calling this thing Project Greenfields, and that's also the Twitter handle that you would see. Um, Now, Greenfields, I can't tell you too much about, but that's kind of where the whole science fiction bit comes in. It is the the object of contention in the book. Okay. Um, Greenfields is an actual thing in the book, but I actually went through a bit of... um, What's the word? What's the word? I applied my mind and I realized that Greenfield itself isn't as big part of the plot as it used to be when I actually started writing the book. So it wouldn't be fair to actually call the story Greenfields. It is a significant part of the plot, but it's not the most important thing. I I think the most important thing in the plot is actually for the main character to to make peace with who he is, what his kind is, what they represent to the world, and making it his, him, make it, making it his own. Okay, interesting. So re, re, rekindled kind of alludes to love that is lost, the flame of love that dies, 
but then it gets rekindled when something happens in your life. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. 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 No, okay. I just, I just, so, just replied. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's one of the first things that actually happens in this book is um, his mate of 20 seasons actually disappears on him. And uh, part of his drive to actually find Greenfields is to find out where did she go and why did she leave. Mm -hmm. so that's kind of the, the carrot part. Um, the stick part would be the... Um, in, in our world, you'd probably call them the Mafia. In my world, I call them the cartels. He's got the uh, biggest cartel in Bridgend looking for him, wanting to do some not-so-nice things to him. And eventually, everything just kind of comes together and you get this realization as to what is happening in this world without giving away too much of the plot. Okay, cool. That sounds interesting. We Sorry, with with that being said about characters and the way that they sort of obviously uh, create themselves, one of the things that I want to get into is is that like in previous conversations with you, and these are things that you've said at least that I've been able to pick up, you've said that you pour in or you've poured in a large amount of yourself, especially into this particular novel. Um, when you say that you've done that, what exactly are you sort of insinuating? Like, is there like a large amount of like personal investment into this? Because I know that obviously writing is definitely something that can eventually become like, I think personally straining dependent on what kind of characters you're writing. So what is your connection with these books? Uh, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. Um, in terms of the books, it's my hobby. It's what I do when I'm I've got I need a creative outlet, but I don't have anything else that I can actually invest my time into. It's what I do over lunch at work if I don't have to run to the pharmacy or the shops. It's what I do between five and six in the morning if I wake up early before the kids do. In terms of the characters, um, the first book I wrote rewritten, that was fairly easy because I... Um, I related to the main character pretty straightforward. There was kind of a one-to-one -one mapping in our ideologies, our personalities. But now, for the second book, I started off with a character that is very different from me. I mean, this uh, this Kudu is not very highly schooled. Um, he struggles to write. In fact, in the first draft of the book, he was illiterate. He couldn't read at all, but that didn't end up working for some of the scenes. So I kind of improvised on that. I mean, he's, he's I wouldn't say an alpha because I don't think that concept applies to Buck. But, you know, he's, he's strong, he's fit, he's a physical worker, he's a mercenary, he's tough, uh, you know, he's attractive. Not that I'm not, but... I don't relate to him on that level. So I've kind of had to make him part of me. Um, part of it involved changing my persona. Part of it involved, you know, doing little mental exercises. What would, what would I be feeling if I was this character in this situation? And I had to go through a lot of those things to actually get into the swing of things. When I did, I actually found that we have more in common than I initially thought. Um, Oakmore slash Asando was a bit of a dunce in the first draft, but I mean he's uh, he's he's developed himself along the way. And I th I think he's I think he's likable. I mean that that sort of pulls towards the idea of like a muse kind of character where Asando. I don't know. Like I'm I'm making my own kind of assumptions here. The way that you're mm -hmm. telling these. And I want to sort of like talk a bit more about that kind of writing process where the character writes itself. People tend to either talk about muses and they tend to talk about this when they are talking about the writing process. And we have interviewed a fair amount of uh, writers who've mentioned the idea of at least either I'm going to call it musing, um, yeah. but the use of muses. Like how how much is the idea of a muse actually? something that you rely on um i mean the idea of a muse is very i don't know airy fairy 
um, being a computer programmer, I tend to think more in terms of a virtual machine, like a you know, with, with VMware, you've got a physical piece of hardware, but you've got five or six virtual machines running on that. So imagine installing a character within your brain. You spin up a virtual machine or a, you spin up a character for a Sando. And then you spin up a character for his ex-girlfriend. And then you spin up a character for his other new love interest. And you leave these things... And you let them kind of fight each other out in your brain. And then you just come across a song or a piece of writing or a piece of art that just clicks. And then suddenly the character in the back of your head says, ah, wait, that's me. That's me doing this. Then you start, you just write down the idea. Okay, there's this big breakup scene. Which, by the way, was the first scene... No, it was the second scene that I actually planned for the book. And I kind of built the story on that scene. And then eventually that scene ended up not being in the final draft. <laughs> which, which is fine, because it's all about the outcome at the end of the day. Mm. But it's usually a trigger. Um, and a lot of the triggers I encounter are songs and music. I mean, there's this one song by, what's his name? Avantasia. It's called Cry a Little for Me. I love and that song, by the way. I heard that song and I thought that is what's going through Oakmore's brain as he's being beaten and tased for breaking into this place where his girlfriend is kept. So that kind of developed and that was the scene that I really wanted in the story that I didn't end up putting in the story because it didn't work out. I didn't... So, Sorry, mm -hmm. I, I just thinking that I didn't take you as a person for power metal. Uh, I like symphonic slash um, melodic metal a lot. Okay. Avantasia specifically, and Avantasia. also Nightwish, and who are the other people? Avantasia. You know, actually, I've actually mm -hmm. I've actually discovered Ghost recently. Ooh, Ghost uh, as, is great. As well. Uh, I mean, questionable themes aside, the music is lovely. You should uh, you should listen to the <laughs> to to the radio show every now and again on Sundays. We, we I play should. A lot of, we we play a lot of uh, <laughs> um, that kind of music, particularly on on Sunday evenings. Yeah. No. I mean, I love music that's got um, something to chew on yeah. in terms of the lyrics. Um, is not you know we listen to a particular Afrikaans radio station on the way to work in the carpool and I hear these songs and it sounds like the people just plucked words that rhyme and smashed them together and got somebody's you know just got somebody who can sing the words for them and that frustrates the heck out of me. I want to hear a song and I want to feel something. And then I want to go and think about it, listening to it again, think about it, think about it. And then, aha, this I can use for my story or this I can use somewhere else in my life. That makes sense. Um, a, lot of, a lot of art actually inspired me uh, for this project. Um, obviously, oh, I did mention, did I mention that this was going to be a visual novel? Yes, I did. did um, yes. So I was looking around for artists. Uh, from the get-go and I actually found a lot of artists with work that inspired me to create specific scenes or create specific characters. I mean um, Hermon is one of the characters in the book. He's an otter. I never thought I'd write an otter but he just came to me through one of the pieces of art that I saw on furry Twitter and I've, I've completely become um, Infatuated with this character, and I might actually write a story about him at some point. That's that's cool if you can find art that sort of broadens your horizons and makes you write because, or draw or something that's outside your comfort zone as well. Yeah, it's just that trigger that you need. And um, yeah, that's part of my writing process. I go through life and I, I get triggered by little things. It just sends a whole snowball effect going down the hill. So when you're saying visual novel, are we talking, you know, Hayseed Night kind of visual novel, or are we talking about, like, Dating Simulator kind of visual novel? Um, 
it was going to be kind of a low budget point and click adventure um one of my main selling points was going to be that you would be traveling on the bridge and metro rail to where you needed to go so you'd be looking at this rail map of the city most of the time you'd click on a particular station and then you'd go there you'd do something um there were two or three uh, romanceable characters above and beyond the x number of that are actually in the novel you're gonna have to read to find out but um yeah it, it would have it would have had dating simulator um elements in it but it was going to be a story at the end of the day okay. so what makes that different from sorry scratch did you want to no 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 just reacting okay uh, what makes that different from, like, when it comes to writing a book, what makes it different to, to write a visual novel? Uh, just sort of the idea, when it, when it comes to when you're just immediately thinking about it, when you think about writing a novel to writing a visual novel, what what are the immediate differences that you're already beginning to sort of suss out? Well, the one of the two main reasons why I gave up on the idea of a visual novel is the more forks there are in the plot, the more writing you've got to do. And, I mean, if your visual novel is basically a linear plot, you might as well sell the people a slideshow. You'd want them to be able to make decisions that affect the outcome of the story. Um, and for that, you need to have a very organized analytical brain. And I just realized I'm not organized enough to do that. Um, I drew a big map on a A1 piece of sheeting of all the possible uh, plot lines. And I just found, you know, um, it, it was going to be chaos. I wasn't going to be able to, to get it done. The other problem, of course, was I'm not an artist, so I'd have to pay somebody to, write, to do all the art for me. It was going to cost way too much. I think in that regard, the AC Knight is a very good example because the artist actually wrote and did the art and did the voice directing um, themselves. So yeah, you need a very analytical brain, very organized. And to be honest, furry visual novels kind of fled, exploded in popularity, and then I get the impression it kind of fizzled out. I mean, I don't necessarily think that that was the case. Um, again, uh, Sandra is actually one of the, I guess, forefronts of the idea that it's still alive. It just depends on whether the storyline itself is, I guess, worth telling. And I think that when it comes to your novel, it would definitely be worth uh, telling in that kind of way. And not to mention the fact that, you know, there are probably people who would maybe want to help possibly if you though, wanted to, yeah though honestly i'm a control freak um my colleagues who work with me i mean i'm a software developer they know as well i just i just grab work from people because i want total control over everything um so letting go is very tough for me and i think with something as personal as this book it would be 10 times worse um, I was going to say one more thing about visual novels. Oh, the other thing with visual novels is I'm not convinced that the funding model is sound. I mean, there's basically three options. The first is you've got an ongoing development cycle where uh, you've got patrons paying you every month or paying you every time you bring out a new character or a new chapter. The other option is you actually finish the damn thing and then you sell it to them at a certain price. Or the third option is you just give it away for free. And, you know, I just had trouble seeing it being financially viable in any of those, um, under any one of those models. I mean, if you write a book, it's simple. You write it, you send it for approval, it gets approved, gets published, you get paid your royalties. Mm. yeah it's a it's yeah it's sort of the the model for supporting um uh yeah supporting artists differs definitely from from one art form to the other um 
like we spoke about this a while ago and writers are definitely like one of the trickier parts like you can't release your book in chunks because then you're sort of just i don't know giving the whole game away before anything's been produced so something like a patreon model would be difficult to maintain for writers i think i stand to be corrected though no i agree with you on that and you know i don't write linearly i don't write the first chapter first and the last chapter right at Mm. the end i mean even in the final editing phase i actually added a whole new chapter in the book so yeah you can't uh, i can't release it as i finish it then you're going to end up knowing what's going to happen even before it does Mm, exactly i mean what's the word we we had this conversation with many of the writers that we've actually had on and um his name is now escaping me we did have this conversation Uh, with carl gold i think yes with carl gold who i think has a, a relatively strong um support system through it's what's the artist's version of um rukus yeah no uh cal gold cal gold oh you mean his other uh pseudonym no 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 we're uh talking about like he's he's got he it's the one for artists for furries mostly it's not coffee the, it's not coffee i'm um man where they actually stream the writing process. Oh, Picardo. Yeah, Picardo. He's, oh, yes. You can actually... Picardo, which is pretty much the exact same thing as going uh, as, as doing... Because I'm actually a... Uh, what's the word? I support uh, Carl Gold on there, for instance. And I mean, like it's it's like 2 $3 a month. And if you have enough people... It's not that it's going to, you know... What's the word? It's not going to financially support you but at least you can see that you know there's an amount of money that would be coming in and then i'm it's a suggestion that if you're looking for a way to say fund something like a visual novel then that would probably be a a very fun way to do it good work yes (laughs) oh please excuse me (laughs) we've got a very naughty dash and yeah it's okay it's, <laughs> we we live with background noise. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, to, to stream writing, that's a thought. I actually don't know if I could pull it off, to be honest. Um, if I could stream the conversations in my head directly to the internet without having to verbalize them, yeah, sure, I think I could entertain a few people. But um, <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't know if that's for me. And, you know, the other thing is I'm not in this to make money. Uh, the money is nice. It helps me to promote the book. But ultimately, I'm going for, uh, you know, for reviews. And my number one dream, of course, is that somebody would write fan fiction or create fan art of my work or write something that's uh, based in this universe. I see that as the greatest compliment you can give somebody. Yeah, so I mean, it, yeah, yeah. if you use that universe to sort of live yourself in through different mediums, I guess, like maybe, I mean, esoteric as it might be, maybe someone does an, like a tabletop RPG or something set in that world using some yeah. information from your books or something like that. I mean, I've become the greatest fans, honestly, because hmm. it kind of affirms that you you created something that allows other people to think or helps other people to live out their fantasies yeah that's cool that's kind of in the back of my head i mean there was there was a way to do that at some point um i can't it was called fanfiction.net yeah fanfiction.net there was also a, a particular um, I think it was a porn site at the time, but where? <laughs> <laughs> so what you would do is is that somebody would write a scene, and yeah. then dependent on the themes of that particular scene, somebody else would be able to find that particular story, and be able to add to it, and that would be added as as like a choose your own adventure kind of thing. So you'd have two mm. or three different, or four to five, or twenty different writers all choosing different ways of how the story might uh, progress from one point to the uh, to the next 
this is again, like I said, it, it was like where we're talking probably around about 2008, nine, around about there, probably earlier, even 2004, five, um, where I found like these particular areas, because that's kind of what, don't ask me why I was looking for these kinds of things. <laughs> I was just going to ask you. I was 18. No, I wasn't. I'm sorry. <laughs> was too young to actually be doing this but there i was and you would find these stories that would just sit on one another the entire time just based off of either the initial idea and then somebody else would then and that's how a large amount of people actually got practice I think. yes and that's a great it's a great way of having to um sort of do that it's it, I, it's like the best interactional writing i've seen Yes, and if you take one step back, you could probably say it's like uh, online role playing. Yeah, another so, thing that I yeah. did. And you. Yes. Mm. Yeah, there's there's the two schools of role playing: the one where you involve mathematics, and the other one where you don't. And both are valid, and yeah. both can help you with your writing. Mm. I'm using the, I'm using the math one these days. I've very yeah, it's, very it's, much fallen for D and D. Yes, no, my my mentor, um, my old maths teacher, he actually gave me the the initial idea of building the story around a human relic. Um, he's into these math-heavy board games. And, you know, it's serious, serious, serious math that goes into those things. Mm. If you skew the damage of this weapon a little bit towards the one side you really affect the game and you cut the play time in half you've got mathematical models that actually tell you whether a game could work or not the cute little cards and dice and that's all also all uh, an afterthought really interesting so, so yeah how do you how do you see now that you finished this particular chapter of your uh writing what's your next step i've got a couple of ideas um somebody actually suggested i do a third book and i call it rebooted mm. but no that that's just a joke computers <laughs> <laughs> sticking with the re theme but yeah no I've, I've got a i've got two stories set in this world but it's going to involve completely different characters in fact it's going to be uh set in the time where humans and mammalia coexisted. Uh, the one is a military story, which I'm cautious about because I'm, I don't have a military background, so I'm going to have to do a lot of research on that. And then the other idea I had was a origin story for the mammal world, how these creatures came to be, what's their purpose, um, but again, there's a lot of research that needs to be done. Something I might actually get done sooner is a story. Um, for the moment, it's called Clip Singer. It's a, uh, I don't want to say it's like a Moles and Boone style story, because that's got a bad connotation. But it's a, it's a romance. It's set in the 50s in a non-sci-fi world with animals as uh, characters. And it's uh, set in the Little Karoo, Interesting. somewhere Lanesburg or one of those places. Mm. And it's going to involve a, uh, a, a female sheep as a main character. So talking about spending time getting into the head of the character that you're writing, that's going to be a, yeah, that's going to take a bit of work from my side as well. Die Skarp van Wuster. <laughs> <laughs> no what what fast why why i'm quite keen on that idea is um, my wife is from my small town um not too far from Worcester actually and these small towns look so docile and boring but if you actually live there you would be surprised the amount of drama and gossip and stuff that goes on there because everybody knows everyone and everyone's into everyone else's business. Mm. Yep. Uh, pile onto that the ultra conservative um, setup you had in the 50s. Add on top of that 
that you've got a society that's got animals, sentient animals. I mean, I think it could be interesting. It definitely could be. I mean, and you say that like 50s mentality... 50s mentality in the night no not 90s but like early 2000s um what was it around about between 2000 where was i in i i actually came from vister uh for a very short period of time about two years mm -hmm. and looking back and knowing sort of what vister was like at the time it it's it didn't actually move past the 1950s when i was there back in the 90s mm -hmm. Mm. early 2000s it well you know yeah, remember Worcester is the big city for a lot of the country people mm. and um, Worcester yeah. is where you go when you want to get stuff done yeah and Hermanus <laughs> was the Worcester by this year. yes yes and I mean Wolseley where my wife is from is mm. actually it's on the metro rail network so there are people commuting from there into Cape Town each day so Wolseley's not that bad, but there really are places in the Karoo where time just kind of stopped. Mm. Um, I mean, if you go to somewhere like Mikey's Fontaine, you know, you might as well live in a museum. But so with that being said, like explain how train culture really works then um, and how train culture sort of affects the way that that your stories work, because like you were saying just now, like every single time we, we move from one point to the next, it's because there are these massive hubs of stations. So yeah. every single station has its way of, of life. And it's it's much like you were mentioning that it's it's a lot like uh, Zootopia. But, yes. Yeah. So, so in, in uh, I mean, there's too many cars in Zootopia, to be fair, but, you know, it, it you're selling it into the American way of thinking. Um, Bridge End reminds me a lot about a uh, lot of London. Um, it's a, it's an old place. The railway lines were not always planned. Um, keeping in mind, you know, there's different rail operators. Some of the lines are on on viaduct. Some of them are underground. Some of them literally plow through buildings where they just cut a big hole in the building and stuck a, a railway line through it. Um. In this world, the mammals don't generally own cars. Some of them, some of them do, but they tend to be the very rich. There's a lot of bicycles and there's some motorbikes, but Joe Public uses the train. Um, the stations themselves tend to be social hubs. They tend to, you tend to go to the station, and at the station you'd find a bazaar where you could buy things like tobacco and food. They don't have a shopping mall culture like we do. It's more, um, how should I say, old European style. Yeah, you've got your bakery and next to your bakery, you've got your fruit dealer and then you've got your tobacconist. And then you've also got the whole South Africa slash Africa feel to it where people just sit on a blanket and sell medicine, roots, whatever. And these things tend to be concentrated around the stations. So if you're going to go to the better part of town, you're going to be able to buy better quality tobacco. You're obviously going to pay more. If you're going to go to very remote places, you might find that the trains don't stop very often there. You might find that it's old rolling stock. Uh, little things like that. There's this one location where Oakmore gets off the train, which is uh, it's actually it's a mine dump where they used to dump sand. It's this big artificial hill, and it, it's just in ruins. Um, he goes there to clear his mind. You can read about it in the book. The other thing is the... Um, I, I always say uh, your rail network tells you a lot about the society that built it. Um, let's, let's just say, you know, you've got the UK, where they've got a... A substantial rail network that functions more or less, but it delves into chaos every now and then. In South Africa, you've got the overcrowded metro rail. You've got a, sort of a, a very strong nostalgic legacy of train travel that's kind of faded and rusted a bit. You've got the American model where everything and everyone used to ride the train. 
then it got taken over by cars. So it, it tells you a lot about the society. Um, and of course, Regent being a city that's run by cartels, you've got the rail, the, the railway cartel. They are reliant on fuel that they buy from the uh, oil and gas cartel. You've got the trade unions that work in both of these sectors. Everything kind of just meshes together uh, in organized chaos. One of the things about this world is there's no there's no formalized law or constitution. You know, it, it sounds odd to us, but if you look at animals in the wild, they also don't have a set of rules, but everyone kind of knows what they can and cannot do. That's the kind of vision that I had for this society. Um, you can, there's no law that says you can't go over there and kill that guy and take all his money, but you know that if you're going to go over there and kill him, he's got friends and they're probably going to kill you back. So you don't. All right. Fine. So what would you call it? Like a, not rule of thumb, but a, a rule of law. Yeah. Okay. It's sort of a, um, anarchy law, law of the jungle, organized anarchy. Yeah. Organized. It's, it's, uh, it's also one of the things my mentor suggested. He said that Somalia is, is a lot like that. Now, I don't, I've never been to Somalia, I'm not an Africa expert, but as far as I understand, the, Somalia is basically run by mobs. And what keeps things in order is that these mobs can come into agreement with each other on certain things. And that's kind of where Bridge End sits as well. You've got your cartels that are interdependent on each other, and they've kind of made peace with one another, and they know where they stand. So the moment somebody bumps the uh, apple cart, there's a bit of shooting, a bit of fighting, and then everything kind of settles into a new normal again. Kind of um, like knowing Cape Town just a little bit, it, it kind of reminds me of like the, the taxi only, industry. Not necessarily the taxi industry, but like the gang culture, especially in the, I think, in the colored areas of Cape Town. You, mm -hmm. Yes, you could say that. Uh, yeah, where, you yeah. know you know where your territory is. Mm -hmm. They know where your territory is. And as long as you stick to your territory, uh, you know, business as usual, the moment somebody tries to overstep the line, there's a, there's a shooting and people lose their lives, sadly. But yeah, it's kind of what I'm going for. Though I do imagine Mamely being, uh, uh, how should I put this, humans being inherently bad, kind of being forced to be good, that they are the opposite, they're inherently good, but some of them turn bad. Like animals in the jungle, I mean, <clears throat> you don't see lions going around killing buck just for fun, they go and kill them because they're hungry. Yeah. That's the kind of society that I imagine animals or mammals would settle into if we left them to own devices well i mean and there are cities that literally do that in like in the world today where the mayor is someone's pet cat and everybody just sort of like there are written rules and people sort of agree by them anyway and then nothing else sort of changes beyond that and i've seen many societies um have started sort of taking on that kind of ideology, which I guess in some senses does a lot better than having somebody to lead because a person to lead is corruptible at any given point. Humans are corrupt to begin with. Yeah. So, the, yeah. I mean, the, well, the one interesting aspect of not having a written law is that you don't get off the hook through technicalities. Um, if you killed somebody and somebody who's um, high enough in the social hierarchy knows that you killed that person, you're going to get punished and you're going to get punished fairly swiftly. You're not going to go through 10 appeals and, you know, it was not technically murder because blah, 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 blah. You know, they're going to drag you before a council and they're going to decide, okay, uh, do you pay the fine or do we shoot you between the eyes? So it has its benefits but it also has its problems and that the system can be controlled and you can actually end up with a lot of injustice in that way. 
right mm, yeah. uh, i want to sorry scratch you want to go no no no. i was again just responding i want to quickly just change tact you've mentioned your mentor on several occasions now you want to talk us through who your mentor might be and why exactly they'd be so important to you in your writing process well you know the, it, it's my math teacher from standard six which is grade eight nine ten about up until grade ten um and this guy is he's, he's an okay math teacher but he really opened a world for us beyond maths i mean we used to joke in school that if we could bring up a topic at the beginning of a period which interests him we don't have to do maths that day hmm. um and his big thing, um, he actually used to be a recce in the uh, in the border war, so he's got a lot of stories like that. And he's a uh, he's interested in military history, so he could tell you about this battle in World War Two and what if the Germans did this and what if the Americans did that. Of course, he's got the mathematics background. He plays chess. He plays board games. He's got a very broad. Um, He's got a very broad understanding of the world and he's got a lot of knowledge. So I could literally look him up, look him up and go to drink coffee and he, I could say, you know, what can you tell me about, I don't know, conflict in a city. He'll tell you about the strategies and he'll tell you about what happened here and what happened there. So if I visit him, I usually walk out with a bunch of interesting ideas. And the reason I went to him initially for this, um, back in the day when I was still planning uh, rewritten, is that I wanted to know how the military ranks would work in a semi quasi guerrilla setup. And he told me, you know what, you don't, you haven't been to the army. Don't bother with ranks. Just say it's a um, guerrilla culture, and everyone kind of does what they want to. And I ran with that. And now I've got my entire civilization based on that concept. Interesting. And then, and then with the, I told him I wanted a city which was fighting itself over something. And he said, yes, you should have something that is hidden and valuable. And you should have them fight over that. And that's kind of where the whole sci-fi aspect of this was born into. This was amazing. As as we say in Afrikaans, fun van die os op die jas. One of the interesting things about this book is that the majority of writing actually took place during this fun thing we called the pandemic. Mm. <laughs> and I, I managed to slip one or two lines in the book which actually alludes to the pandemic. Um, we've got our main character who hasn't had his flea dip for a couple of seasons and the one of the conditions of employment is that he has to go for his dip and his new employer casually mentions, you know, you know, there's a pandemic doing the round with <laughs> fleas now, but obviously those of us who've lived through this thing would know. One, one interesting thing is you end up with a lot of leave, but you're under lockdown level five. You can't leave the house. So mm. what do you do? Uh, the moment my kids find out that I'm on leave, they just want attention, 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 attention all the time. So I actually took a week's leave and I didn't tell them. I pretended to sit behind my laptop and work for five days. And I actually worked on my story on uh, Rekindled. Didn't you mention, you mentioned that on Twitter at some point. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I did. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I actually got a lot of writing done, but I'll tell you, writing for eight hours a day is as exhausting, if not more exhausting, than writing computer programs for eight hours. I mean, you know, one would, yeah, one would imagine. Scratch. Yeah, at least coding, you have some some guideline or some deadline or well, structure to work towards. But um, when you're writing creatively, it's like anything goes. Now with, with coding, you know, you there, there is what I call donkey work. There is work that you can literally autopilot. You know mm. what to do. You can just replicate it or draw the process out a bit. 
And that's also why I can listen to music while I'm writing code, but I usually do my writing in complete silence. Yeah. Because I need that extra bit of concentration. Because I've got these five characters in my brain that are watching my every move. And when I write something, the character would say, uh uh, I didn't do that, or I wouldn't do that then you, you've either got to decide, okay, do I change the character or do I change the scene? And the further along the process you go, you're more inclined to change the scene than the character. That makes sense. How, like, when you're changing the scene, for instance, rather than changing the character, like, how long does that sort of rewrite take? Actually, not as long as you think. Um, what I usually do is I've got three screens at home and at work, so I would take the original text and I would cut out the pieces that definitely won't work, and I'd leave gaps. Then I look at it again and say, okay, does this broken piece of writing kind of make sense? If it does, I end up filling in the details. If not, I might just scratch the whole chapter and write it from scratch. I mean, so, for example, yeah. No, I was just saying, so you're actually just coding, but writing. You could you could say that, yes. Um, I had a one round of uh, beta reading. Uh, one of the other big names in the furry fandom actually helped me with that. And she came back and said, you know what? This doesn't feel right. This doesn't sit with the character. And I thought about it and I said, yes, she's right. So... The same things end up happening, but I change the dialogue and I change the the internal process, the internal thoughts of the characters in a way that work better, and I'm very grateful for that. So, speaking about the idea of big names within the uh, writing community, as a yeah. person who has now also won awards, um, or at least gotten to the point where awards were, you know, being given and that you were close to winning awards. And the word you're like, looking for is nominated. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yes, the imposter syndrome is drumming up mm. in my back of my mind, but do carry on. No, I mean, like, how does it feel to be amongst, you know, you know, nominees? In fact, like, you were, you're a winner at some point. I, I, I won the... I yes. won my book won the Leo Award. Yes. Um which the little line is still sitting on my shelf. My kids just want to play with it and I tell them, Nope, that's oh. that is toy, you can't have it. I let them hold it for a little bit every now and then, but no, they can't play with it. You know, I always I always think to myself, Yay, I actually won an award, but then I think, okay, it was the first year the Leos were actually given out. Maybe they didn't have enough books and they felt they had to give me something you know imposter syndrome is a big problem for me oh it's a big problem for a lot of people i think so but yeah no i don't i don't think of myself as being one of the big furry writers um at best i think of myself as the best known south african furry writer um <laughs> i guess i stop you there <laughs> And say that, like, as a person, like, all you need to do is read some of your short stories, for instance, and, like, it's very, very evident that the kind of writing styles that you have, they're useful, they're, well, I say useful, what is the word that I'm looking for? They're inspiring, um, and I think your story itself is actually inspiring as well that you as a South African furry um, are immediately able to sort of, yes, I am fluffing you a little, but I'm doing it with purpose. Because having read your work before, I think it's definitely worth reading. So anybody who is listening at this point hasn't read any of your work yet. Um, there are many anthologies with your work in it, uh, short stories if you don't necessarily have time to read the long ones. But your books so far have been very, very well, uh, should and continue to be very well received um, in in that sort of event, like the event. 
-hmm. So if you did win an award, it's definitely something. And because I know those awards specifically, it's definitely something that uh, wasn't just handed to you because you happen to have been an also rat. You flatter me. <laughs> well, thanks very much. I'm honored. Um, you know, as I say, the, the biggest reward you can, well, I don't know, all writers are probably not in the same school, but I think if somebody tells you they liked your work, that's the biggest, best thing that can happen in a day. Yeah, I mean, fair enough. You, know. you, you want to be, you, you want to, part of this is also sort of giving, uh, like giving joy to other people, like giving them something to, to chew on, to think about, to live themselves and lose themselves in. Like there's a lot to be said for creating work that does that. Yes. I mean, for example, um, I think some people wouldn't review a book on Amazon or Goodreads if they wanted to give it two or three stars because they they worried that they would upset the author. But honestly, if I got a one or a two star review and I read the review and I can see this person actually read the book and they invested time and they have concerns that they bring up, I appreciate that immensely. Mm. Um Obviously, you don't want a one-star review that says, lol, this book sucks, blah, blah, blah. But, or you know, if somebody... <laughs> yeah, furry, fail, go to hell, what, what. But if somebody invested time in my book, I appreciate their opinions, uh, even if they're not positive opinions. And, mm. I mean, it's a... Ah, we are all works in progress. I'm still learning. I'm still learning things every day. Yeah, I mean, I the, mean, the one or two star first, reviews are sort of worth it if it's constructive criticism at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah. Well, not, not, it doesn't even have to be cons constructive. It can just be valid. Yeah, fair um, enough, yeah. I mean, I've seen reviews on Amazon where they say uh, the package was bent or mm. this, the book isn't what I thought it was. Or the font, the f font choice is yeah. off or something. Yes. Yeah, or the book arrived two days late, you know. But anyway, that's that's a whole conversation on its own. I mean, for example, the rewritten I did completely in the first person uh, past tense. This uh, rekindled, I've actually snuck in some parts that are written in the third person, um, mostly to indicate when you're switching between the current and a flashback or a dream or a... Um, or a actual revision of something that happened in the first book. Okay. I might just add this, by the way. If you haven't read the first book, um, give the second book a try. You don't need to have read the first book. All the important parts that you need to know to understand the plot, I do cover in the second book through flashbacks. And to make it interesting, I've presented them from the new main character's point of view. Hmm. Okay, cool. Um, I know. Yeah. Go. Go. No, oh, I was, no, no. was going to go off on a tangent. Um, Your tangent is valid. Go. Okay. Uh, uh, what I want to say is um, we spoke a while ago about some of your short stories that are, that are in anthologies and uh, collections of works and stuff like that. Are, you, are there any more uh, short stories or potential anthology collaborations in the pipeline? Um, the Clipsinger story started off as a short story. In fact, it started off as a, a erotic short story for a um, anthology called Thrill of the Hunt. Mm -hmm. But when I started working on it, I realized there's more potential. Yes, so it's not a short story anymore. Uh, that tends to happen quite a lot. I start with something short, but then I just feel uh, I could do more with this. So no, no recent short stories that are published. Okay, cool. Lots of lots, just lots of lots of ideas on Google Docs, but nothing nothing um, I could share at this stage. Okay, cool. Just curious. I right, Ivik, now mm. you can go. <laughs> I've lost it. Oh, sorry, man. Sorry for <laughs> jumping in there. So, then. No. So yeah, the uh, our my relationship with Go Publications continues. Um, if you remember correctly, my book rewritten was the first full-length novel that they published back in the day, and I think both myself and Sean have learned an awful lot in the process. Um, there were a lot of criticisms about the uh, typesetting on the ebook initially. 
one of the peculiar things that happened to my previous book as it was classified as erotic fiction on Amazon, mm, that's uh, sorry, yeah. which is which is certainly not. <laughs> so I wonder how many people actually bought it and read it and said, oh, dear, I was scammed. Where's the, you know, the good stuff? Where is the meat? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Where? They wanted meat. All they got was bones. Oh. But uh, yeah, so the new book, as far as I can tell, is classified as uh, science fiction. Um, yeah. The ebooks have been doing well. I haven't see, seen anything related to typesetting. I believe Sean has switched to different software as well. I mean, Gold Publications have grown a lot. They uh, they started doing merchandise. They've started doing music for one of the series. They've got some big name authors uh, on their books right now. Including yourself. <laughs> you, you're making me gush, yeah. But anyway, they, um, I, I like working with them. Uh, Sean's given me valuable feedback on the book as well. And um, there's a lot of stuff that I, as a person who looks at Google Docs, wouldn't know. For example, he would say, oh, by the way, as a tangent, there are illustrations in Rekindled that wasn't there in Rewritten. He would say, you know, you can't put this illustration right where you introduce the character because it's going to cause a page with a single word on it afterwards. And things like that, I wouldn't know. And that's the kind of stuff you would fall into if you do self-publication. Okay. And right. an another one of our favorite bones of contention is when I use a South African or a UK centered word and he would say what is this I would <laughs> say oh it's that or the uh, the um, the other side of the coin is where I would use a word and I would be certain I know what it means but it actually means something completely different I'm mm. trying to think of an example um, I've got my character bulking when he's mm. in a state of trauma or a state of panic. But, that's uh, B-A-U-L-K, right? Yeah, but apparently that's not correct. It's B-A-L-K. Ah, my... But okay. bulk, actually, if you look it up in the dictionary, it means to back away from something. It doesn't mean to emit a sound. Oh. Um, Another peculiarity is that um, I opted to call all the female hoofers in my story doe, because doe is such a lovely word. I don't want to call them cows or um, ewes or sows. Mm. I just call them all doe. And I called all the, the male buck, buck, even though that would be something you'd say of a deer. Fair enough. Deer. And uh, Sean pointed out that his spell checker wanted to um, change Fainbos to Fandoms. <laughs> That's funny. Yes, there, there are a few South Africanisms in this book. I would hope a few would at least, like, make it in. Like, if the word... What's that? I, I said I hope a few of them would at least make it in. Like, Fainbos is a very nice touch, but something, like, if you could... If, if we could f uh, sort of get the public understanding of what a bucky is i would kind of enjoy that oh uh, yes now i i speak of a lorry oh uh, yeah i mean for americans that's also a funny word yeah because they like they like talking about trucks yeah <laughs> and then um uh, i also found out that the railway terminology is a bit different in uh, the u.s and the uk in the uk you'd call a you talk about uh, a turnout in the U.S., you would call about points. Okay. Just, just a little example of the things that we had to change. And then my my autocorrect spelling does all the U.K. Uh, labor, O-U-R. And mm -hmm. then when I get my proofs back from Sean, it's all labor. Mm -hmm. with just the O. So it, it's, a, it, it's fun. But by the time you get to typesetting and final edits, you're so hot full of reading the same stuff over and over again. You just kind of want to get it out the door. I understand, yeah. I I heard an interesting theory about why the Americans drop the U from words like labor and favor. Like, What is your theory? The theory is that when you would write 
things in like a a telegraph or so, sorry a telegram or uh, newspapers or something like that they would charge per letter. So mm. in, in words like favor or uh, yeah favor flavor uh, what's the other one I said uh, whatever um, yeah in words like that they would drop the unnecessary u because without the u the message the, it sort of still gets the word across so they would save money so capitalism literally changed the language i think that <laughs> it's a nice theory yeah it, it's a fun theory to have but it's actually incorrect no oh. favor <laughs> and flavor were actually the originals with just the o mm -hmm. the ou was actually the british who felt that french spelling was actually more avant-garde i don't know it was, ah, it was okay. uh, they, the, the original spellings with the o were the more the ones that the americans had the more, more grammatically they're, correct they're they're more correct spelling wise okay interesting. Um, so and and then there's also what was it there's something in the 10 hundreds mm -hmm. called the great vowel shift and you'll actually find that in like i think it's 1066 it was all just the o ah. so the it's um ou is french influence far later and that split was when the americans also split again from uh british uh from british rule okay interesting. something something along that line but yeah like that uh, the postage one that one sounds really nice though yeah i i don't know, I, I was told that somewhere or heard that somewhere but yeah it it would make sense in my head that that would just like it's uh what's his name uh culture adopting uh common practices into language which is like a language evolving essentially but it apparently it evolved l into a longer format because the english wanted to be oh, french yeah I, <laughs> uh, I saw i saw um a post from actually the uh the guy who did the cover for the book the other day where he had the French word for toe jam. Oh boy! Um, and he's and the subscript to that meme is, see, any everything sounds more romantic in French. Mm. Yeah, it's couveur something something. I can't I can't remember. <laughs> but yeah, it does. It does. It does sound. It almost sounds like something you could eat. Yay! <laughs> Yay! I like this idea. Oh no. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Jan. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, tell us yeah, a bit so... more. Like, sorry. Um, mm -mm. Let's let's talk about brass tax here. When exactly is the book coming out? Um, so, when could people expect it? There's also a T-shirt that's coming out again. That yes. people can also expect. So for those of us who are also South African, international listeners, things like that, let's talk about dates as to when things are released, how they're going to be released, and how our, uh, how listeners are going to be able to get their hands on it. Okay. So uh, pre-orders are open um, directly from uh, Gold Publications' website. I mean, theoretically, you can buy pre-order from Amazon as well, but I always tell people rather support the publishers directly because you're supporting a small business you're not giving mr bezos another you know super yacht or whatever he wants to spend his money on nowadays yeah. so you can do a pre-order directly on the gold publications website um, you get a great discount and you're also helping with the costs of doing that initial print run uh, for south africans i also have pre-orders open um, if you order it from me before the actual launch date, you will pay 198 Rand, which is the price I sold uh, rewritten for. Um, the final price, once it's available, is probably going to be around 250 Rand. Um, just as a note, if you are in South Africa, just give it a bit. Don't order from overseas because you're going to pay at least the cost of the book for shipping as well. Mm -hmm. I am bringing in between 15 and 25 copies, depending on how much interest there is. And I'll be selling them out of hand for a lot cheaper. Mm, yeah. And, yeah. You, yeah. and so. you can get them signed if you are so inclined. Yeah. 
If, like, the, if, you, if you don't mind, just keep one copy of... If you still have copies of uh, Rewritten as well, keep a copy of Rewritten and Rekindled for me as well. Yes, I will do. I've actually got two copies of Rewritten left, uh, apart from the one that I keep for myself. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we'll, we'll stock up, and I hope to have the stuff in time for the next local convention. Uh, the official release date for the printed book is the 5th of July. I believe that's just after Nash International America Day. Um, the ebooks are available a few weeks after that. That's usually what Gold Publications do because they they do the hard copies first. And then, yeah, it's going to be available through most retailers, uh, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, apparently. But yeah, buy from the publisher directly if you can. Mm. Or one of the other small furry publishers or distributors. I know in Europe there's Fuschelswam. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, they will be stocking the book. I believe there's a guy in Australia who's carrying stock. So yeah, that that's kind of the plan going forward. And then, uh, if you all remember, I had the Hoofer shirts done for the convention we held in what year was it? When did we do the whole? Um, it was Ikudeni. Any uh, was it Ikudeni? So that was two years ago. Yeah, Three? those were the last. Mean? Those were the last of the Hoofer shirts. Um, I'm planning on doing a special launch edition of the Ufa shirt. It's going to be screen printed again. It's going to have one extra color. So it's going to be a bit more, I don't know, full bodied, if you want to call it that. Um, the original Ufa shirt had blue as the main color. Uh, now sticking with the trade union theme that kind of filters into the book, I've decided to make all the clothes red in this shirt. Um, you'll know we've got a, a ambassador for red clothing in our country. I'm not going to elaborate on that. Mm -hmm. Or the motherland. <laughs> child of the child of the soil. Mm. So yeah, uh, the the shirts are going to be red. The shirt itself is going to be white, and then there's going to be uh, brown, black, and grey panels on it as well. But, yeah, if you follow me on Twitter or my book on Twitter, you'll definitely see it when it happens. And I might send some of these shirts overseas. I don't know yet. We'll see how things go. That's I... probably going to be around the time that I get the physical uh, books here, which is probably going to be October-ish. I wouldn't okay. mind another. You know, okay, just random. For, for those of you who are listening right now, a random conversation point in respect to the Hoofer shirts. The first time I got one, I spilt red wine on it. Oh, well done. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, that was, it came out. That was at the convention, right? Yes. The same day you bought it. The <laughs> same day I bought it. Hi, yeah. Vic. <laughs> oh, also. You, yeah, sorry, go ahead. And you mm. wore that shirt during the TV interview that they did. Yep. And I still wear it like at least once a week oh yeah well i wear it to work when i want to yeah my concerts I, are also in rotation for my normal work day shirts yeah no i, I fear i've i've outworn mine i use them to sleep in nowadays oh, okay but uh they're holding up well the prints are lasting much longer than i thought they would mm. yeah and, actually and i mean if you if you know what it's like in a house with two kids Everything gets washed every week, regardless of whether it gets worn or not, because mm. everything ends up on the floor every time. Yeah. So it stood up well. Um, Sadrock said his is peeling a little bit, which is understandable. The shirts are four years old. So yeah. all in all, I think it's a good quality shirt and a good quality design. Design was done by Sitzka D, who is also in the Hoofa community. You'll be supporting a good cause. Let's just put it that way. Nice. Also, I need to bring this back up. Um, Sudan has pointed out here to me that one of the reasons that uh, US and English, US and UK English sounds and looks so different is also because uh, American spelling was invented as a form of protest, apparently. Like Noah Webster, when he wrote the, the American, like, 
version of the dictionary uh, as a lexicographer was uh, wanting to make the language more straightforward, but also to deviate from the UK spelling as a form of showing American independence from British rule. So one of the things is dropping the U, the other other ones is changing I-S-E to I-Z-E and that kind of stuff. Yes, yeah, we we call it Arahat. Yeah, spite. fair enough. Yeah, <laughs> good on them. But yes, you're not going to simplify English. Mm. No, in, English is it's, English is dumb a, as a language. It has more. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. It's a dreadnought. Mm. It's sort of a, um, a soul collector. It plucked pieces of every other language and just holds on to them. Oh, totally. Yeah, and it's got, and it's got a different word for everything. You don't really modify your words like you do in other languages. It it's got more exceptions to rules than it has rules. Yes, um, yes. <laughs> but on the pl- on the plus side, I like English because there's no accent characters, mm-hmm. unless you use a French word, which is mm. also not something I really do. Yeah, fair enough. A lot of loan uh, word, a lot of loan words though. Mm. Yeah, but that's yeah. Mm-hmm. Go, go, go. Mm-hmm. I was thinking aloud. No, I was just gonna say that like that's pretty much the only reason why English is still relevant today is because it has bar none rolled with every single punch that is ever thrown at it. <laughs> like you look at South Africa, it is the third most spoken language in as as a first language. Um, and is also like, it's, it's not even, it's, it's one of the most spoken as a second language, but as a language, English is actually not as well spoken as any of the other languages that you'd find in South Africa when it comes to major languages. Mm. And yet it's still hanging on and universities are still either arguing for Afrikaans, which it's valid, but the thing is, is that English is definitely beating it out for no apparent reason, aside from the fact that nobody apparently wants to speak. Or not nobody apparently wants to speak, it's just that everybody believes that English is the, like, learning language. Yeah. Uh, in universities, specifically. Like, just random aside there. Uh, that's It's something that we've been dealing with for ages. And... Also, another random aside, I think it was two years ago, now th- almost three years ago, was the first time that somebody actually wrote a full-on um, paper in, I think it was Zulu, and before that it was uh, also Osa. Um, so we're behind, so very, very far behind when it comes to academically accepting uh, other languages in South Africa. Mm. Random aside. So... Like, if we're talking about things like um, your books, for instance, uh, based on sort of these kinds of environments, the kinds of difficulties that you'd have just based off of languages. And I do actually, can can we delve in on that? Yeah. Like, how exactly, uh, is that is that a, a core issue that, that people are, are dealing with? Um, um, people are dealing with? Um, like, yeah. Yeah, I think I know what you mean. Um, I've had people ask me why didn't I write this in Afrikaans. Um, it comes down to the market. Mm-hmm. Um, you're, I'm already writing for a small audience within a small audience within a small audience. Um, if I were to write this in Afrikaans, I'd probably sell one copy into the furry community itself. and. Uh, I'd have to have this break into the mainstream literature community. Mm-hmm. And my perception, I don't know if this, it's the truth or not, but my perception is that if it's not about politics or rugby or the Boer War, you're probably not going to sell many copies in South Africa. Have you mm. ever approached a Afrikaans publisher? No, I haven't. Um, this is assumptions based on what I see on the shelves in the bookstores. Yeah, fair enough. But, um, yeah, the other thing is, I don't know if I'd be able to write this book in Afrikaans. Um, one of the things that bothers me is you can't really do past tense. Uh, you can't really tell a story in the past tense in Afrikaans because mm. of the het gedoen. 
or the het geweet was gewees. It, it sounds clumsy, so you'd have to write in the present tense, which doesn't feel right to me because, I mean, this stuff isn't happening now. It, you, the main character is basically telling you what happened earlier in his life, if that makes any sense whatsoever. Mm. Mm. No, I understand. The, the other thing is yeah, um, we don't we don't have a Afrikaans we don't really have an Afrikaans keyboard uh, so you're either stuck with the US keyboard and you would use Alt blah 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 to make the special characters I just find that uh, it's a it's a bump in the road for me when I mm -hmm. write I'd like to write quickly. I don't want to pause and stop and think, okay, I want the copy key or I want the accent uh, mark or the accent mark here. Oh, what is the alt combination? I just want to type 100 miles an hour and then later I'll tidy it up. Mm. Plus, on top, of, on top of that, uh, my day job is programming uh, computers. That's all English. We've got this one client, by the way, that did try to do a lot of his work in Afrikaans. So you've got a table in the database where it's not, uh, we're in the fruit industry, so it's commodity and very, very tight. And I always get confused when people talk about a factir or a, I um, can't even remember the stuff. It's so difficult. Plus, plus number. It just feels cringeworthy to see a mm. database table where half the columns are Afrikaans and the other half are English. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I can understand that. Just stick to one thing. I mean, there's a time and a place to be proud and patriotic, but it's not in your database. Yeah, I, I've well said. Um, if I were to translate this book into any other language, I would love it to be in Japanese. Because I think the Japanese would like to see something like this, you know. They like their manga-ish things, but they also might find it interesting to see something that's from Africa. I don't know, that might be a horrible assumption, but I think this the story could work as a manga. Oh, as much as we like seeing oh. stuff from from japan or from the east if i can put it as bluntly as that i think it would be interesting for them to get a different culture or to learn or reach out in a different culture as well yeah it would and i mean i'm still waiting for netflix to send me an email saying hey we want to make a manga out of your story mm -hmm. i mean i'll scream so loudly you know you'll think it's the rapture that's happening you'll probably hear you all the way from uh, from uh, Pretoria. I mean, they'll, they'll probably hear me scream on the International Space Station, but yeah. <laughs> let's 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 dream. Is that, your high, is that your highest aspiration? Japanese, like manga version of your. That's my highest aspiration. Second oh. highest would be uh, sort of a Netflix-ish adaptation of it. My, the lowest of my aspirations would be Disney offering to buy the franchise from me, like they did with Star Wars. Um, <laughs> that would be a nettle for me, because they would pay well, but uh, they've got a reputation of milking things to the point where they turn to dust. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I'd be able to you know, send my children off into the world and know they're going to get butchered like that. Because, you know, y your characters grow on you. You've got yeah. this idea that, okay, this character's now done his thing. He can now go into retirement and he'll be happy for the rest of his life. Yeah, yeah. I feel you. But, I mean, <clears throat> so speaking just very sort of briefly about that again how many more how many more iterations of of your world would we be able to see in future do you think um if i end up doing the origin story um that's probably going to be a trilogy so three books but that's going to again it's going to feel it's going to have a very different look and feel than the books that are out there because this is going to be a human society with ma with mammalian in, 
doing their stuff in this human society. Um, that's the origin story. Then Otter, the, the working title for the other one is Otter 2. That's the military story. That might be a short. I don't know if that's going to happen. So let's say four books, if all goes well. Though my money's all on Clipsinger for the next thing that I um, might end up publishing. I, f I feel there's a, a th there's a gap in the market for brainless romances <laughs> in the furry world. Something like a Mills and Boone, but for furries. All right. <clears throat> but like oriented around your... Uh, would that be oriented around the universe that you're creating or is that going to be a completely or uh, like universe completely uh, different universe find the, the words the, the clips in a story would be a non-sci-fi setting mm -hmm. so it will basically be our world but with animals instead of humans okay like zootopia i mean humans don't get mentioned at all there's no weird discoveries or relics or anything like that things are just the way they are okay I mean, one of one of the things that I keep seeing in my mind is that you've got this this little town in the Karoo, which is known for its sheep farming, for its wool farming, and then you've got these town folk who are mostly sheep. Wolseley? No. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, Wol Wolseley's actually more apples and uh, grapes. Uh -huh. Sorry. No worries. <laughs> Not called but, Wolseley because they farm with wool. Yeah. But, yeah. To, to be fair, Citrus Dahl is known for a citrus fruit, so... Yeah, yeah, I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, we've, we've got a lot of work with people in Citrus Dahl. Uh, one of my colleagues used to work... Oh, he's from Citrus Dahl. And he says... Now, the overseas people will probably not get this, but he says... Nein, this is me, Citrus Dahl. The Citrus City. <laughs> <laughs> Has it gotten that big now? Okay. Oh, I don't know. I, I haven't been there much. I just see the oranges from the road. Mm. <laughs> I I came from Citadel as well. I spent yeah. my first six years there. I, yeah, I. It's a bit of a not a slum. It's just yeah. It feels. Maybe I was just looking at the at the town through like rose tinted glasses when I was a kid. But yeah, I was there recently and. Yeah, it's not what I remember it to be. A lot of small towns have that problem. Mm, feels like it. When you when you don't have the the post office, the police, the school, the railways to prop them up, you know, they really have to show some sort of a reason to exist. And a lot of places, sorry, don't really have a good reason to exist, and then they just kind of crumble and fade away. Mm. Which is. Yeah. Uh, which is another theme that I'd like to explore at some point is, you know, the whole small town way of thinking. Mm. If you want to, if you want to see an interesting sort of, not really visual novel, but kind of a walking simulator game about that, I've heard of it, but I haven't played it myself. So I'll look into it before I give you a higher recommendation than just taking a look at something called Kentucky Route Zero. Okay. Yeah, might be worth the sort of also small town America kind of finding your way in a in a collapsing civilization kind of thing. But yeah, uh, might be worth looking into. Kentucky Route Zero. Yeah, Kentucky Route Zero might not be a fun game, but it's at least interesting. Yeah, write that down. Route Zero. Okay, got it. Uh, so Romy mentioning um, what's the word Vitbank. Mm -hmm. Vitbank. Yeah. Is, isn't that called Emalatlini? Yeah, Emalatlina, which means pretty much exactly the same thing translated. But yes. uh, no wait, not Vitbank. Yeah, Emalatlini now means uh, what's the word? City of coal. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Romantic. Hmm. As if Vitpunk was very romantic to start with. No, it really wasn't, and honestly still isn't. The town is... <laughs> also, by the way, random random aside about Vitpunk, um, the air is so polluted there that you could probably light a cigarette 
and have cleaner air through that filter. Yeah. <laughs> it's an interesting thought. It's, it's like Durban, where the driest place you can be is underwater. Actually, uh, in the back, very back of my mind, I want to do a nuclear fallout story. Um, mm. And I wanted to call it Requiem for Cow Mountain. Interesting. Where there's some sort of a nuclear meltdown at Kuberg, because I figured that Kuberg could mean Cow Mountain. Maybe, yeah. I see where you can get yeah. that. Kuberg. Yeah. Mm. Gotcha. Kuber. Yeah, well, anyway, that's yeah. that's the kind of stuff I think about just before I fall asleep or just after mm. I wake up in the morning. Mm. Oh, that's the kind of stuff yeah. that you usually should write down somewhere as a good idea. Yeah. Yes. But it would be, it, and honestly, like, if you can continue to, and I know that I'm asking here, but, I mean, if you continue to use, you know, South African sort of themes and uh, now I'm using this term themology but the thematics there we go that's a better word mm. uh, the thematics of you know South Africa and how South Africa sort of breaks itself out like you're both doing I guess um, you're looking at that from a, a mystical sort of mythological perspective on the one hand and on the other hand you're pretty much writing what you know which is one of the major tenets when it comes to writing in the first place. And well, you write what you know, or you need to, uh, you, you just need to know a little bit more than the people are reading your stuff. Yeah. yeah true. The same with the indie, I suppose. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. No, um, I, I was going to say something now. Well, yeah, that's what I was going to say. The, the stuff we take for granted today could be the stuff of legends or folklore a few decades from now. Mm. You know, oh, wow, they they built nuclear power plants and they allowed people to live next to it. Or, wow, they burnt oil to drive their cars. Can you believe that? Mm. Things are moving so fast that that kind of stuff is definitely going to become, as you said, like stuff of legend, which is archaic. fascinating. Yeah, archaic is a better word. Yeah, yeah there's, there's a lot of stuff to explore. Yeah, for sure. Okay. But, um, Adwolf, uh, Art, what's Art, Art, Art. Um, what I'd like to ask again is, is maybe let's let's go through the what to expect again moving forward, just so that everybody who's listening one more time. Um, so we are promoting your book, Rekindled. Yes. Rekindled. Rekindled. Yeah, the book's name is Rekindled. Um, if you follow my Twitter page, you'll see the cover. The pre-order price for South Africans is 198 rand, which means you can pay now. And as soon as I order stock and it arrives, I will send it to you. The regular price is going to be 250 rand. If you're from overseas, you can pre-order it directly from Gold Publications. And they will also get the book to you as soon as it is in print. The shirts and the ebook will follow once the printed copies are on their way out. All right. And also, uh, do check out uh, Gold Publications. Uh, yes. By, yeah. And also Fanged Fiction, which is uh, their adult imprint. That's something that also didn't exist four years ago. If you're looking for something that's a bit more spicy, you can uh, try that. So there are currently, what's the word? There are three, uh, if you're looking at the Gold Publications website, there are three options available here. One of them is the paperback uh, pre-order for Rekindled and then rewritten and then rewritten ebook available. Yes. So all, all of these will be available in ebook eventually, yes? 
Yes. Yeah. No. Uh, Sean usually does the uh, printed books first, and then the e-books. It has yeah. something to do with the way the typesetting works. It's yeah. just the logical way to do it. All right. And yes, I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to talk. Um, I hope that you know, I could inspire somebody to spend a bit of time in this world, maybe explore it a bit further. It's, uh, it, re it's it really does the world for us people who write books. I know that. And, uh, and a big and a big shout out to everybody who's helped or contributed to this. There's too many to to mention. Um, the two amazing artists who did the interior artwork, um, Erkin who did the cover, Furry Writers Guild for their support, people who did the beta reading. It's really just a, such a supportive community and it really inspires one to keep going, even though it's tough sometimes. Mm. And we're, we're always happy to have you on, um, yeah. a contributor from that particular arena as well. I know that from our side, we love having writers to begin with. It's It's been, when it comes to having interviews, writers have been the main uh like the bulk of our our interviews particularly because they don't seem to get as much um publicity, publicity exposure exposure so we love having like you know people like you on because the stories that you can tell are amazing thanks very much you really do flatter me and i um i shall reward you i don't know how but i shall reward you <laughs> Go find a dop. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll buy you a dop. How's that? Hopefully but, I can drink by that point, yes. <laughs> but also, um, you, you're more than welcome to invite me to talk crap with you as well. Um, oh, sure. You know, obviously, obviously now I'm promoting the book, but I've got a lot of other uh, uh, things to share as well that's not related to the book. No, I think I... I, I, I could be. Yes, I could probably talk for four hours... Um, about all sorts of random shit. Mm -hmm. cool. But anyway, I yeah. I, I get... Yeah, go. Sorry, I'm going to stop talking. Hold on. <laughs> no, it's fine. I was just, uh, again, I was just replying and uh, just saying, uh, yeah, as always, Jaco, it's been a pleasure having you on. Um, and yeah, I I definitely look forward to getting myself a copy of the new book. Putting it, yeah, putting it with the old book as well. Seeing if I can finally get back to reading. Yes, see, I haven't read in ages, but I'm a bad reader. But I'm a book hoarder. It's a bad combination. Um, but yeah, uh, thank you so much. Looking forward, like I said, looking forward to the next one. And yeah, uh, yeah, we'll keep in touch, and hopefully we'll have a convention again next year. Yeah, and we'll see. Uh, that'll be nice. Then uh, yeah, we can do some catching up. Yeah, that'll be fun. Okay. Okay, okay, folks, stay safe out there. I'm sure uh, Ivik's going to play some music for you. Mm -hmm. Maybe Ivik. you should play. May, maybe you should play that song that we yeah. spoke about. The um... probably just a little for me by Avantasia. Yes. yes, I think I do have that in my list of music. I'll cry just. Okay, so you are you are asking for cry just a little. Yes. Um, right. click, click. Yeah, while you're yes. looking that up, um, yeah, uh, as I said, Ivex going to be playing some music from here on out. Uh, maybe just give him until like 10 to set up and maybe get a cup of coffee or something. And then, yeah, uh, from all of us here, uh, everyone have a good day, evening, whatever's mm -hmm. left for you in the Sunday. Have um, a good time zone. Yeah, have a good time zone. Um, and yeah, catch you again soon. Yeah, catch you soon. See you around, everybody. Bye-bye. Cheers, cheers.